Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. I'm Alan Potcotter, and you're listening to Call Talk for February 6, 2019. Today's topic is drama, the poison of customer service. If you're listening live, we, we invite you to be part of the show and ask questions. Here's how you do it. Email me at calltalk at benchmarkportal.com. I want to ri- remind everyone that all of our shows are archived and available to listen to at BenchmarkPortal.com any time of the day. And now I would like to introduce the host of Call Talk, Bruce Belfiore. Thank you, Alan, and welcome back to Call Talk, everyone. As all contact center managers know, the call center industry can be full of drama, and that can be poison to the customer experience, to employee satisfaction, agent retention, and really your overall center performance. In this episode, we'll learn how to identify different types of drama and discuss things you can do right now to overcome the negativity associated with drama. So to explore this further, we've invited an expert in on the topic for you, uh, Eric Berg, who is CEO of Call Center Pro Consulting and columnist for the Contact Center Pipeline. Welcome to the show, Eric. Thanks, Bruce. Good to be here. Okay, great. Well, Eric's a a 25-year veteran of the contact center industry and has run multiple inbound contact centers, including over 900 agents in three sites, as well as over 200 at-home agents. He's the founder of the Midwest Contact Center Association and is a national speaker and columnist for the contact center pipeline. Eric is founder of All Calls, Call Centers Outsourcing, and CEO of Call Center Pro Consulting. He focuses on creating a culture of success, reducing attrition, and other items that are important to contact center success. He lives in Minnesota, where he's been basking in the record-breaking sub-zero temperatures. Uh, Eric, you told me before the show here, it actually hurts to breathe outside, right? (laughs) Yeah, when it was uh, last week, we were... uh... Around 50 to 60 below zero wind chills, and when you went outside, your lungs actually felt that, like they were burning. So I stayed inside. Well, that, that's pretty dramatic uh, right there. So, uh, wow, that is something. Well, thank you very much for joining us despite the, uh, the cold there. Well, let, let's start with the following question. Uh, what do we really mean by drama in the workplace here? And, and you know, because it's one thing what happens. The other thing is how we react to it. So help us to define what drama means. Sure. Um, well, I've been in the in the contact center industry for some time, and over the course of my career, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of different types of drama, um, and I took the opportunity to really kind of categorize them into different, uh, let's say, names um, that I've come up with. One, uh, one I say is uh, the negative Nelly, and so a negative Nelly really is that person that you hire. They're super pleasant. They're happy in the interview. They make you believe that they're one of the nicest people and they'll make your center even better on a day-to-day basis. Then the training starts and all of a sudden negative Nelly jumps out and they are negative about everything. They, they don't think the training was good. It was too fast. It was too slow. The trainer wasn't effective. They get on the floor and the chair's not comfortable and the computer and I wish I had two monitors and I only get one. And why does that guy get a stapler and I don't? And next thing you know, they're, they're spreading that negativity across your contact center. Um, so we'll have some ways that we'll talk about a little bit later on how to work with, the, with, with different types of negative um, or what I call poison in your center. But negative Nelly is obviously one that we've all, we've all run into. The second one is your friend, uh, or I call friend poison. Friend is the one that they build trust with people really quickly. They make you feel as a leader like, you're, like you can talk to them about everything, that you can trust them, that they're your confidant. Um, you can even talk to them about... Pr- uh, different problems you're having and potential solutions you might be looking at too. Next thing you know, you get sucked in and you start talking to them about some problems you're having in the center. And you may even throw some good ideas at them just to kind of get some feedback from an agent perspective. Well, next thing you know, this friend is going around with that, that knowledge that they have from you and changing what you're saying 
and basically calling, causing drama by saying leadership is going to change this. This is what I'm hearing. And they're trying to be friends with everybody and, and spread that misinformation, um, which then can lead to extreme negativity, morale issues, et cetera. And so yeah. identifying who your, who your friend poisons are and being very careful when you're talking with them is, is a critical element to, to successful management of your contact center. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I I hear you on that. That's uh, really important because oftentimes that person who uh, you know approaches you as your friend is doing the same thing with everyone else and has the same need to be viewed as a friend by the others as well, and um, so that can create a lot of drama. I can definitely see that. Okay, right. please, please the ones continue. Who, when they hear drama, they they perpetuate that drama by agreeing um, and and making mm-hmm. that other person feel like they're right. And so it's a good way to, to, you know, they want to show the empathy, but unfortunately they can, they can per, uh, perpetuate that negativity and actually foster growth of, of negative energy and, and what I call poison. Yep. So the, okay. next, the, the next one I have, um, I, I just call them the offended poison. Um, that's, that's one of those things where in business we all have um, individuals we work with that are offended by, by something. Um, and in this day and age, it seems to be getting better. As a leader, you try and walk on eggshells around certain topics and around certain people because you really don't want to offend them or, worse yet, make people cry uh, when, you're, when you're addressing things. And so it's not always poison, but that's something that you, can, you, you want to be aware of because that individual can then go back and say, uh, my leader said this. Uh, and they'll come out of the office with tears in their eyes, and and all the people identify you as a leader, as a mean person. Um, and so it's, it's just being very careful how you're dealing with different types of personalities. And and your your offended person is obviously one that you need to learn to to work with as well. Yeah, uh, just a couple of thoughts on that, and that's where you know you need to have your antennae up with regard to the kinds of things that. People can be offended on uh, on a personal level as well as on a group level, and uh, just to uh, make sure that you are aware of these things. You know, you need to have your antennae up and your empathies out and your ability to um, make sure that you're uh, editing your communications in a proper way. I mean, we've had other call talk episodes just talking about how to make sure that you know the audience you're addressing so that you can uh, address that audience with the appropriate empathy and with the appropriate understanding. So a really important one, Eric. Thank you for sharing that one. Yeah, exactly. You do have to be very selective with your words because they'll be taken out of context often. Uh, But I I think that's in any any relationship, really. Uh, The last one that I've really categorized is what I call the supervisor poison. To me, supervisor poison is your most dangerous poison. That's when you have a supervisor, uh, you promoted somebody who maybe was one of your best agents, um, you want them to be one of your best supervisors or coaches, um, and they are the type of people who can get sucked into the poison. Uh, so they start hearing uh, negativity from their team, uh, and they perpetuate that negativity, uh, oftentimes exploding or snowballing that, that negativity to levels beyond what one person, an agent level person could do. And the next thing you know, you have an entire team of what I call it uh, team poison, uh, all because the supervisor is not redirecting that energy or, or is getting sucked into the drama themselves and trying to be friends with their, um, with their employees. But, you know, this one is absolutely key, and I think that it is one where – uh, management responsibility is key as well. Uh, we, we've done many shows on supervisors as well, and one of the things that we have to keep in mind as managers is that those supervisors are oftentimes people who are not fully trained for their position. And also the definition of fully trained oftentimes does not include having their antennae up for all of the issues that we've just been talking about, or you've been talking about, Eric. Uh, right. And Oftentimes those supervisors are good agents who have been promoted into a position that they may feel a bit overwhelmed at. It may turn them from being excellent agents into being, uh, you know, poison supervisors because of the fact that they don't know how to approach things and they do feel, um, you know, you know, offended and they do feel like they're being judged in a way that they weren't in previously. 
And so one of the things that we can do as uh, supervisors, as the managers, and I'm sure you'll get into this later on when you talk about solutions, is keep in mind that those supervisors are the most key people, I think, in a call center. Uh, they do need to be properly trained, and they need to have their eyes open. In other words, it's not just a technical training. It's very much a training on, on uh, how to be first-level management because they are first-level management. They haven't been first-level managers before. They need to understand that there are certain responsibilities and certain uh, pressures that come with that and that they need to understand that those poisons are going to be you know, dangled before them all the time, and instead of grabbing onto them, they have to push those away and, and uh, choose uh, a better path. I agree, and you're taking away something from the future, but that's okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I guess I got passionate about that. I really like supervisors. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, so those are those are really the, the types of drama that I think – perpetuates the majority of your negativity. There's obviously in every center different types of personalities and different types of drama that are going to come up, and, and all of those need to be really done or managed on a one-on-one -on -one basis, understanding what the unique situation is, coming up with a customized solution in order, over, in order to overcome that drama, and looking to make sure that you're constantly on edge, watching for what negativity could be affecting your overall center's performance. Great. Okay. And then before we do go on to solutions, let's sort of uh, push things a little further in terms of how things can go bad. Like, what happens if you have drama and don't consider it a priority to fix it? In other words, there are a lot of managers that just want to sort of shut the door, leave that drama outside their offices, and um, you know, not have to deal with it. Talk talk a little bit about what that when. Uh, you you have the drama and don't consider it a priority to fix. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I've been in the business long enough where I've obviously been a, a first uh, or an early on supervisor myself, and I've made errors in judgment. And I think, um, as you said earlier, with uh, with experience become, comes wisdom. Um, and so over the career, over my career, I've, I've gained a lot of wisdom in how to deal with different types of situations that come up. But early on in my career, there was often times where I myself got stuck into the drama. Um, I do remember, you know, one that was, and I don't even remember what the exact situation was, but I remember there was a policy the company had. My agents were coming to me with, with complaints about the, the policy, although um, the policy was standard operating procedure and, and industry best practice. It was something that was obviously uh, disrupting the agent's mentality in some, some form, and they were becoming negative. Instead of addressing that, I perpetuated the negativity, um, agreed that the, the policy was in um, and, and tried to empathize with the agents in order to build rapport. But what ended up happening was that negativity became extraordinarily strong on my team. Um, it, it came down to, to me realizing I didn't truly understand the policy and the reason that that policy was put in place and how it affected the organization. What ended up happening was my team became um, uh, extremely negative um, I had an increased attrition of my time uh, of my agents. I had an absenteeism increase that I wasn't expecting. Um, so basically, what ended up happening is that little bit of negativity on one policy perpetuated a snowball of of poison in my team uh, that that led into led into other things. What what also that happened was other little minor things that were problems. All of a sudden, people started talking about all the little minor issues too. So they would they would uh, cascade. One person would talk about one thing. Next thing you know, somebody else jumps in. Well, and this, and then, and and then they would be talking, and they, and what about this, and what about this, and next thing I know, I, I really had a snowball of negativity, um, and I end up having to bring in a, one of my senior leaders to help me better understand how how to address the situation. You know, although this was 20 years ago, it's something that I think all new supervisors uh, grapple with when they when they get started in the industry. And dealing with different types of personalities and, and understanding how you need to how you need to jump on top of it before it's an issue, or it, it will snowball out of control. Um, mm -hmm. This particular situation really affected a lot of my personal performance as well. You know, when your when your metrics are falling, your attendance is, is falling, your attrition is increasing, the customer is going to be affected. And so, um, if you if you're not dealing with the drama, you're going to see you're going to see some negative impact on your entire organization. Yeah. No, these situations, as you call it, a snowball effect, and that's probably because you're up there in Minnesota. 
uh, you know, the other way to think about it is it's, it's like a vacuum cleaner for dirt, and uh, it just keeps on pulling in, pulling in, pulling in, and uh, that's, uh, you know, a problem that uh, when you're – your center is the vacuum cleaner and has to deal with all that. Uh, it's it's really really tough. So um, yeah, um, I hear you. I hear you on all that. So well, how about if we go to the how to overcome these situations, the solutions uh, that help to take care of the kinds of stories that you've just been telling. Sure. Well, and first I like to always say that what we talk about here is 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 maybe more of a blanket summary of some things you can do, each individual situation that, that, that occurs in your own personal center really needs a customized approach. And I think if you're looking at it like that from a management perspective, you're going to see a better success rate than saying, I'm going to take an out-of-the-box solution and try and fix my problems. Um, but from a big picture standpoint, I think there's a few things we can do to overcome drama or poison in our center. Um, and, I, and, and I think I'll just outline, uh, I think there's four or five different things that, that we can go through here that I that, that I believe will really help. Obviously, the most important, and you hear this in, in just about anything you read, any article you read, any seminar you go to, and any management class you ever take, communication is the number one key. Uh, negativity is typically caused by a mis misunderstanding of information or a pre presentation of misinformation. And so uh, one of the things I've learned is to be communicating things in real time to the agent directly. Um, whether that be an email, text, in the knowledge base, uh, CRM, uh, in-person desk, desk, it doesn't matter how you're communicating, but that you're putting the message out yourself. When you hear somebody um, or you hear a rumor that something is happening that's different or maybe somebody misunderstood, you're immediately re-communicating the appropriate and correct words um, to, the, to the entire team so that it's not spinning your narrative into something that it's not. Um, and that way you're getting the desired outcome with your information. You wanna stay away from that mob mentality and, and with misinformation, people share it, then it gets fun. I think we've all done that, that exercise where one, you stand in line, one person says something to the next person who says something to the next person who says something to the next person. And by the time you get to the end of the line, the message that was, was conveyed was totally different than what was started. And that's mm -hmm. exactly what happens if you don't communicate directly with your with your agent population. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. The uh, the thing you were talking about when it's a child's game, uh, childhood game, it's called telephone, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're playing telephone, so you go around the circle. We did that in scouts recently, in fact, uh, with assistant scoutmaster. And yeah, it is funny that some of the things that come out and how things get uh, totally jumbled up as a result of being passed from uh, you know mouth to mouth. So, uh, yeah, yeah, very. And as you mentioned, too, there, there's something that I can remember writing an article on back when I was in school called contagious emotionalism, you know, and the fact that uh, people do latch on to things uh, that spread like wildfire. Uh, and uh, you, you do have to come up with strategies to counter that. So uh, please continue. Tell us more about your solutions. Right, and one of those strategies, obviously, real-time redirect, or, or one of the other solutions that I have. And the real-time redirect, although we touched on a little bit, really is about when, when you hear somebody say something that their perception maybe is different, and they're seeing something as an issue or a serious issue, but really it's unfounded, that immediate redirect can alleviate that issue before it becomes a poison. So somebody has misunderstood something, then they rephrase it differently, and then you're your response should be an immediate redirect saying, nope, uh, here's actually what we were saying, and make sure that people are truly understanding the message that's being sent. Um, it's especially important with your frontline leadership because um, they're the ones who are going to hear the, the misinformation coming back from the agents or the feedback loop going to them from the agents, and they're, they're the ones who are really positioned to sit there and say, nope, actually what, what your leader said was different than what you're perceiving, and here's, here's the way it really is, and here's why. Um, and so that real real time redirect really does stop that negative energy and can stop the poison immediately. Mm. And you know one of the things with real time redirect, uh, you know I agree with you 100 percent. And sometimes it's important to take one extra step, which is to try to understand why the misinformation was created. What was the motivation? What was the source of the misunderstanding? What could be something that may be 
uh, not only a, a fix for the current misunderstanding, but also for future misunderstandings by just addressing something, which could be have to do with a relationship between a couple of people or uh, sort of a view of the center or of your mission or something that is uh, distorted or not uh, really understood by the uh, by all of the agents. So anyway, just thought right. I'd throw that in. Right, and Bruce, that also goes to a good point of it may not be the misinformation of what you're currently talking about. It may have been some other situation that has already perpetuated a negative atmosphere, and now anything you say is going to be construed as negative. And so it's understanding the root cause of the neg negativity. Sometimes it's not your current topic or your current discussion or your current policy. It's something else that's bigger. And so sometimes you do have to deep dive a little bit more and say, hey, what is the root cause of our negativity, and what can we do to fix that root cause so that each other situation that comes up isn't going to first be per perceived as a negative situation. Right. And, and that can take some courage, too, because in some cases right? the finger ends up pointing right back at you. <laughs> and so that does take some courage to do it. Sadly, yeah. like my, my initial story, oftentimes that negativity can be pushed right back to the frontline supervisor or the manager or the director, VP, whoever, whoever that, that may be. So you have to be humble as a leader and say, am I the one perpetuating the negativity? If I am, what can I do differently as well? Perfect. Right. Okay. Good. So there's a couple so other things. Oh yeah. So there's a couple other things I think can be done that are really going to help you with your with your poison. One thing I've done in all my centers, and I've seen a huge success with this, is I create a voice of the agent committee. Um, it's very similar to the voice of the customer, um, but what I do is I take my I take key agent level individuals and I, and I create a committee where they get together once a month and they talk about the voice of the agent. Important that you take different types of people and bring them in. Um, the reason is you want to have your happiest employees in there, but you also want to have some of your least happiest employees in there because you want real information. If you're a good leader, you want to know what the problems are. You want to know how things are affecting your agents and you want to make sure that you're doing everything you can to make it better. And so creating that monthly employee in, um, voice, of the, voice of the agent committee allows them to talk about how changes in the organization may have affected them, how it may affect the actual customer experience, um, how, how, how the leadership and, and, and who, how they're handling things are affecting every level. Um, and a lot of times they can come up with, with the problems. And nicely for you, they will oftentimes come up with the actual solution to the problem. And so they'll say, you know, instead of doing this, why can't we do this instead? And if you have an open ear, you're going to be able to take that information and really use it to get your, your center more positive. Plus, you have that, that buy-in from, from your agents. So spreading that change is going to be a lot easier because they're the ones who came up with that change. Yeah, well, that adds so much to credibility and to uh, getting people's buy-in. Uh, there's a, a case study that we did actually involving one of the Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, uh, places that we were having problems with um, uh, engagement, agent engagement. And they did exactly what you talked about, which was to form a, an involvement committee and had an open door policy. And they also did one other thing. There was kind of another leg on the stool there, which was to have a mission statement, which was something that uh, we encouraged them to do. They came up with a mission statement. And when all those things came together, in other words, there was uh, open door policy on the part of the management, involvement committee on the part of the agents, and a mission statement hanging on the wall that said, you know, this is what we're all about, and it was something they could all be proud of and, and point to. Uh, it, things really came together. It, um, it really t uh, turned a situation that had a lot of negative drama in it to a very positive one. Absolutely. Yeah, and I actually wrote an article about employee engagement where I talked about mission statement, making sure that the agents understand that mission statement and how that can really – affect your employee engagement, which, of course, anytime you have happy employees, you have happy customers. So I yep. totally agree with you on that one. Mm -hmm. Good. So the next one the next one I came up with was an incentive committee. It's very similar to the voice of the agent, but this is a committee of agents who take your budget for incentives and motivation, and they're the ones who are going to determine how that money is going to be spent. So I give my incentive committees that every month based on the number of hours we, um, we're working – and those agents have that budget in order to do with it how they want. They may do contests. They may do parties. They may do awards. It, it, it doesn't matter to me because it's the agents determining what motivates them and what that, how that money can best be spent. Um, 
And by doing that, you know, in the past, I'd always said, well, I'll give everybody a 25% or 25 cent bonus for every hour they work if they have perfect attendance. Well, what I found is that didn't really help my attendance because if somebody missed one day, well, now all of a sudden instead of missing one day, they're going to miss three because they're not going to get that bonus. So might as well keep missing days. I was spending money that, and I wasn't getting a return on that investment. When I threw it over to the incentive committee, they created ways where you could get a, a name and a drawing every week at Perfect Tenants. At the end of the month, they were giving away TVs or, VC, or well, VCRs in the olden days. Um, uh, we actually <laughs> gave Netflix, a uh, one-year Netflix membership uh, recently. And so it's really identifying what do the agents want, what's going to motivate them, and let the agents pick it, give it out, and spend it. Um, and it, it's amazing what that has done for employee morale and incentives. Uh, the metrics have improved, uh, quality has improved, um, attendance has improved, and, ret- and retention has improved. So um, it, it's amazing when you give your, your agents weapons to, um, to make things better, that they, they will do a far better job than you oftentimes. That's a fabulous, fabulous idea. Okay, good. Well, we're we're uh, getting down on time here, and we do want to get to a couple of questions. So let me uh, ask Alan to come in and uh, to give a uh, listener question, please. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, we have a couple of questions here, one from Jeremy. We have a fair number of intergenerational drama. Can you give us some advice? Hmm. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, I think we all have intergenerational drama. It's, it's it's uh, the nature of the beast. Different people of different generations tend to have different ways they like to, to work. Um, one of the things I, I say is, you know, it's, it's good to do research on different different generations and understand the different unique characteristics of different generations so that you're you're interacting with them in different ways. Um, it's important, you know. I think uh, Robert Half did a, a survey or a or a study once on how to work with different generations. Um, and one of the things is to understand, like, baby boomers are perceived as more reserved, um, whereas millennials are, are also called uh, Y and X are often uh, more collaborative. And so when you're dealing with coaching and counseling and, and leadership, you know, a, a baby boomer, if you're a supervisor and a baby boomer, you may think an authoritative management style is what everybody wants because that's what you would want, whereas if you're managing millennials, uh, that is not what they want. They want more of a coaching style. Um, and so it's really looking at your own management style and saying, am I am I customizing my management style to the different personalities and behaviors that are in my center, whether it be based on different personality and behavioral and background um, things within the agent or whether it is generational and customizing everything to each individual. Um, I've learned early on that when you take um, our younger generation, the, the millennials, and you give them an olive branch of, of, of power, um, like the incentive committee, and you say, here, I'm not going to tell you how to do it. You're going to tell me how to do it. They embrace that, and they go crazy with, with things you'd never think of. Um, and oftentimes with, with baby boomers, um, you can be authoritative with them, but even, even with baby boomers, if you, give them, um, if you give them a string, they're going to take that, and they're going to do some amazing things. So it's really putting trust in your agents and understanding the different ways that people are, are motivated and going forward that, that direction. Um, I do want to back up one second because we did miss one of the most important things you can you need to do in order to overcome uh, poison. Um, and so I ha- would hate to miss it, but it's supervisor training. Uh, I believe only, according to the study I read, 17% of all call centers actually invest in any training for their supervisors. And ultimately, like Bruce said earlier, you need to make sure that your supervisor understand how to deal with different types of people and how to manage those people and what expectations are there. And I think if you're investing in that training, you're going to see uh, a, a big improvement in both how to deal with poison as well as how to deal with your multi-generational differences. Here, here. Okay. Agree with that 100%. Um, you know, one of the things, too, with the intergenerational things, Jeremy, is that, um, and, and Eric talked about how you need to communicate with different generations in different ways. Uh, obviously, people are all the same, but they have different communication styles. Those styles tend to be um, characteristic of their generation, although that's not across the board with everybody. Uh, but you, by being sensitive to that and being aware of it, it means that you can craft your communication style uh, to the person who's in front of you 
Or if you have to, for instance, issue an email, uh, you can uh, that, that goes to everybody, or make an announcement that goes to everybody. Uh, craft that message so there's a hook in it for uh, the various gender generations, uh, as far as how they uh, perceive things and how they like to work. And and one of the things with the uh, the uh, baby boomers is that although they may not have exactly the same collaborative style that the younger generations do, they do know teamwork. I mean, all of the boomers grew up playing on teams. And so they understand that really well. And if you can, uh, my, I have found that if you can play into that, that uh, you, can, you can do a good job with them. Um, but, but I think, Jeremy, one of the other things in your question that maybe we haven't addressed quite yet, and that is that how do you make sure they play nice with each other? Okay, not just how do we play nice with them, but how do they play nice with each other? And and there, you know, I think sometimes you have to have some very frank conversations. Um, people will sometimes go into a work situation and assume that the uh, other people there are either like their parents if they're young and will uh, sort of project on the older people the things that they, uh, you know, will have drama about with their parents uh, or similarly, they'll project on the younger people, their uh, children or nieces and nephews that they have drama with. And we have to make sure that they don't, that they are professional and that they learn how to appreciate those other people and uh, interact with them without the drama. And so that, I think, is a combination of making sure that the interactions are as pleasant as possible, whatever we can do to help that out. And in some cases, just having very frank conversations. Uh, Eric, I don't know if you'd like to add to that. Yeah, I actually agree with you. I, I think the other thing is really that education. So a lot of times it's just educating people on what, what different personalities and different generations, how they like to be treated, uh, giving them, I, mean, I hate to put it this way, but giving them the stereotypical um, expectations that people would have as a baby boomer, a Gen X, a Gen Y, as a millennial, whatever the case may be, so that they can understand or see from that perspective. Um, and when they better understand the, the, the different generations, they can interact a little bit better as well. So that education aspect, I think, is key. And you can incorporate that in your training program, or you can bring in a, a speaker or a trainer just for that. Uh, there's a lot of different solutions there for, to, to overcome those, those issues. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one more quick question, uh, Alan. Yes, we have one here from Tracy. She says, I have three members of the same extended family in my center. They bring family drama into the center with them. Any advice? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, boundaries. I think the, the easiest thing to say there is really boundaries. Um, you're, you want to, you wanna, as a good center, you want to bring in people like the people you have that are good. So referrals are going to be a big part of your recruiting and hopefully they, that does work out most of the time. However, sometimes you're going to have families working together or good friends working together, and they're going to bring the drama from outside the center in. Um, I think the most important thing is that your supervisors are trained to understand when that's happening and reestablish what the boundaries are in the workplace. It's separating work from social and understanding that they're here to, to do what they were hired to do and to keep that drama uh, of the family or friendship in the parking lot um, or at home. Perfect. Uh, I think I, I, there's nothing I can add to that. Uh, boundaries are so important in these situations. And, um, you know, referrals are usually uh, a very good thing, a hugely good thing, in fact, for most call centers. But it is a two-edged uh, two knife in some cases. So uh, I agree with what you said, Eric. Okay, great. Well, we've come to the end of the half hour. It's just flown by. But uh, are there any parting words that you'd like to leave with us on the topic before we hand things back over to Alan? The only thing I can say is the best thing to do when dealing with drama is understand every single situation Every single situation is unique, and how you resolve it needs to be unique and customized as well. Perfect. Okay. Well, listen, there's been a lot of pearls from this uh, that I think people can take away with regard to training supervisors. Don't ignore uh, these problems when they come up and actually deal with them. Uh, you know, you need to understand the people, the processes, the things that are causing the, the drama. Uh, your real-time redirect is uh, a great uh, piece of advice, as well as understanding the root causes of negativity and not just sort of uh, trying to pretend that something isn't there that really is there and needs your managerial attention. 
Uh, the agent committees and the incentive committees. I love that, Eric. Uh, very, very good. And and the way you explained it too, and how it's uh, turned situations around. I think that could be very useful to to many of our listeners. So, uh, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. And uh, with that, I'll hand things over to Alan to close the show. Thanks again to Eric Berg and Bruce Belfiore for your insightful discussion on today's show. Be sure to join us next month for another great show or look at our huge selection of archived shows and topics at benchmarkportal.com. And then click on Call Talk where you'll find over nine seasons of this show. From all of us at Benchmark Portal, keep those headsets steady and your fingers ready. This is Alan Pockotter signing out. Have a great day.